Last week, we announced Daryl and Jesse's newest restoration project, the French Panard EBR90, and as you can see, they definitely have their work cut out for them. This week, Jason's going to take us through some of the characteristics of this iconic vehicle, and Daryl is going to show us how he's going to go about restoring this vehicle with Jesse. Hi, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and welcome to Workshop Wednesday. This is the Andron Blind de Reconnaissance 90, so the EBR 90. This vehicle was essentially pre-World War II in the design concept, but it didn't come to fruition until the 50s. We'll start off at the bottom and work our way up because this is quite a unique vehicle in its design concepts. When the driver is turning, we can essentially have about a 7.9 metre radius. If we turn the steering wheel a lot tighter, both the wheels actually turn and we can get to about a 3.9 metre radius. You can see we have our four outer wheels either side which are rubber. On the inside, we have aluminium wheels. These two wheels either side uh, have a hydro pneumatic system, so they're lowered by hydraulics. When they went into design, they had a lot of problem with the actual hydraulics bursting lines and all that sort of thing, but they did fix them along the way. So when these are lowered, they actually give extra traction going cross country and it actually lowers the ground pressure of this vehicle. So being uh, a four wheeled vehicle, four points of contact can be quite uh, heavy for ground pressure, but once we lower these wheels, it gets down to about eight PSI, which is quite good for a wheeled armored vehicle. The tires are what they call the never flat tire. So you can see essentially, and this is a good way to put it, we have our rubber outer. On the inside of that is a lot of uh, cavities that are nitrogen filled. So even if the tyres get hit with uh, bullets and fragmentation, not all of the air will leave the tyre. And the good thing about nitrogen, if we talk about operating it in hot climates, which France generally did in, uh, in Africa, nitrogen keeps cool, so it doesn't heat up like compressed air does. So it'll keep the uniform temperature of the, of the tyre quite low. The Panhard has a really unique engine. Now the engine is uh, fitted in the bottom of the hull, so this is the Panhard 12H6000. So this is a flat 12, a post piston engine. So this can put out about 200 horsepower. It can propel this vehicle at about 105 kilometres an hour. Now with this one being air cooled, where it sits below the turret is its only drawback. If this needs any maintenance done on it, the turret has to be removed, pull the engine out from the work on it. It's air cooled, dual carby. The actual engine block is only about 22 centimetres high, so it is uh, quite narrow and allows it to, to fit in the vehicle and makes the vehicle a lot smaller. To actually draw air into the vehicle, where the turret meets the top of the hull, two fans draw air in and then over the cylinder heads. A vehicle driving on roads, you know, can get over 105 kilometres an hour, so it is a very good vehicle and with its uh, fuel consumption, they can get about uh, 700 kilometers with just over 300 liters of fuel. Within the hull, we have two gearboxes. Within those two gearboxes, we can essentially get 16 different gear ratios. Now they work in conjunction with each other, but the first gearbox will drive the four outer wheels, including the two uh, inner wheels either side, the aluminum wheels. So the drivetrain complete all eight wheels drive together. It's not until we lower those uh, four centre wheels that the second gearbox provides that additional torque and traction to those wheels. Either side, we have the driver and a co-driver. So with this vehicle, being a reconnaissance vehicle, if it's ever gonna come up against something, it'll happen quickly. So rather than trying to do a three-point turn to get out of Dodge, the driver can flick a switch and it'll transfer that drive to the other driver who can then drive straight out. When we talk about armour angles, we go generally either from horizontal or vertical. This is in both planes. So even though we've got our vertical uh, armor protection, we've also got our horizontal, which changes the deflection as well. So if we've got a projectile coming in, we're not only gonna go sort of deflection that way, but also in the horizontal plane. On the front plate here, we have 40 millimeters. On the front angled plate here, uh, which is angled at about 60 degrees, um, we have a 16 mil plate, so the line of sight to actually go through this plate is about 32 millimetres. But the angle on this side is about 12 degrees, so it has really good deflection properties on the frontal arc of this vehicle. On the sides of the vehicle, again, they're 16 millimetres around, um, and on the top, I think it goes to about 20 millimetres. Armour on the turret, so around the sides, 
of this vehicle. Uh, this is about a 30 mil plate. This part just in here, the overhang is, uh, is about 20 mil, but the majority of it is 30. And on the frontal arc, we have a, a, a 40 millimeter uh, protection all the way around. On the AMX 13, we have the FL10. The FL10 has the extra bustle that sits at the back. To make it air portable, they needed to reduce the overall weight of the vehicle. So one way of doing it was get rid of the bustle, which had the auto loader. So just by taking that part out, we reduced the weight of the turret by about 1.5 tonnes. With this turret, the bottom part is fixed, apart from when it traverses around its 360 degrees, which it does in about 12 seconds. We have the trunnions or the pivot point here. So the top of the turret moves as one. 43 rounds on board, and that is a mixture of heat, HE, uh, smoke, and canister. And it doesn't have the auto loader as the AMX 13 does, so it's all manually loaded. We have a negative 10 mils in depression, so 177 mils, and a plus 15, so we're going up to about 266 mils in elevation. When the EBRs come out, they come out with a 75 mil gun. In uh, 1964 to 68, they upgraded to a 90 mil gun. It's essentially the same gun, it's just been rebored out from 75 to 90. This is the CD90 F2. With a lot of the 90 mil guns, we went from F1 to F2 to F3. F3, you'll probably find more on AMX 13, which I believe are electronically fired. The F2, I believe, if somebody can clarify, is actually fired mechanically by the gunner's foot, similar to what Sherman's had. But the interesting part of this is, they've rebored this out to 90 mil, but this has longitudinal lines that run all the way through the barrel. Essentially, what looks like rifling marks, but with no twist. They just run along the centre of the barrel. So this is where they can fire uh, fin stabilised rounds. Four crew members. We have the two drivers. So one sitting here, one on the other side. They generally say that the front of the vehicle has the uh, lighting brackets on. So I believe the other side is the, the front of the vehicle. The driver who sits at the back also maintains the radios. So there's two radios that are fitted on board. And as we look up, we have the uh, commander on the left with the dome cover and the gunner on the right. At either side, there's this aperture here. So this is the, uh, the Mac 31 7.5 millimeter machine guns, which uh, poke out of there. So both drivers have these machine guns and they come with a, uh, a drum magazine. I think it holds about 150 rounds in multi-layers. But as we look at the gun pointing out, the magazines are actually uh, on the side of the gun, uh, not, not sitting on top. The only problem is, if you're firing this gun from inside the vehicle, you're gonna have all those fumes, etc., still inside that vehicle, because your hatches are gonna be closed. With all the guns, they carry anywhere up to four Mac 31s on board. Uh, so you might not always have seen guns fitted here, but you would also have one fitted coaxially to the main gun and one up on the commander's position as well. The French used them in North Africa uh, quite a lot, generally from the, the uh, late 50s into the early 60s. And the Portuguese also used them in Angola. Now there was one incident where uh, the 75mm variant of this vehicle come up against an M47 pattern. No shots were fired, they sort of just backed off because I think they're uh, probably looking at being fairly comparable uh, at that stage. Although I think the, uh, the M47 patterns probably would have come out on top. So how are the boys going to get this thing up to display standard? Well, here's Daz to tell you all about it. There's so much damage to the vehicle. They've been on a range and, and we just don't know what condition everything would be in. So what our plan of attack here is, just is make it a static. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll rescue parts and place them back in position so it, in, who knows in the future if it's, if it's passed on to another collection or whatever, all the parts will be there for a future restoration. Yep. We don't just cut stuff apart and throw it away. We're looking at putting stuff back in so in case in the future, no one has to do the hard yards of searching for it. Even though this is uh, only at this stage of cosmetic restoration, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. How, like, where are you going to start? Well, well, what I'm thinking we'll start with, we'll start with the mud guards and straighten them all out, get them looking pretty, because we don't want to put the wheels on just yet, because they'll be in the way of the mud guards, of uh, us trying to straighten them. So we'll concentrate on straightening the mud guards, panel beating as much as we can, straighten it out, and once they're in, in pretty good condition, we'll put the wheels on. Panel beating mud guards. That might be a good job for Al. Oh, oh. oh it would be a great Best job for them. Al. them. <laughs> Got those ones. Yeah. 
<laughs> with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Hunt will beat the mud guards, and then um, we well, get we get them on. Well, I'll show you here. We're missing the steering arm, steering linkages, but they're in the other one. So we're going to rescue them out. The steering arm comes out here for the pivot. And I'll show you something on here. Even though these things have been sitting out in the range for you know probably 15, 20 years, they've been out in our storage area for a bit. You can't have a look at the hardened chrome surface here. That is absolutely brilliant. Look, still, you know, you'd be happy to have that on any of your own vehicles, I tell you. Beautiful. So that's solid chrome. Well, I, I don't know if it's solid chrome or hardened, chrome hardened or whatever, but it's, you know, it's been out in the weather, it's been neglected, but not a spot of rust on it. Wow. The vehicle, when it came, was put in a container, and as you can see, it's fairly wide. So what they've done, <laughs> they put on a couple of... Uh, uh, caster wheel caster things. wheels that just weren't quite up the spec so they've they've fallen off but we actually have the other bits here that were in inside the, the vehicles when they arrived and things like that so we should be right we should have enough parts for for that we're going to make this just a rolling a rolling chassis yeah you know, and so it can go on display in the museum one of them has had a big chunk cut out the side of it so a big piece here is missing so what we're figuring, we'd rather keep the more solid of the two chassis, and uh, but that's got the, but the other one with the chunk out's got the good wheels on it. But we're just going to transfer the wheels across this one. Okay, and the turret. And the turret. The yeah. other thing that, that's an issue on the other one is a couple of these housings that hold these springs in place have been broken and cracked. So these springs are you know under compression. We don't want to run the risk of any injuries playing around with compressed springs and things. Yeah, so. absolutely. We have, I know the gun's had a bit of damage to it. Yeah, the gun's been, uh, like, uh, at the muzzle brake end has been a bit damaged. And we, I don't think we've got a muzzle brake. I haven't seen one of them laying around yet. So oh, okay, we may yeah. have to try and manufacture one, or if anybody out there's got one, give us a bell. Yeah, hit us up. <laughs> the, the turret basket's pretty mangled, but you reckon that might be salvageable? Well, I think we've, we've got to pull the turret out. So we'll pull it out, see what we can do with it. And once again, if we can straighten it up, if it's if it's not too badly rusted, if it's you know, and it's just it's it's uh, repairable. We'll repair it and it'll stay within the vehicle for future restorations. Well, well this is the uh, donor. What we're going to call the donor vehicle. As you can see, it's got the massive hole in the side of it that, that uh, looks like it was was blown out on the range. You can see that it's it's been sheared off. And this is what's left of the turret basket here. We're just talking about. It's a bit mangled and bent, but a bit. Well, yeah. We'll see what we can do. Yeah. Okay. But the the reason this is the reason why we're not using this hull because it's got this big blown out bit. Once these things have been blown up, they stretch, they tear. It's easy we stay with a proper proper hull. Yeah. The turret has to. The turret's removable because we know that because to to work on the actual motor, the turret has to be removed. Just a weird design, but yeah. oh, that nice flat motor in that, there. Yeah, nice yeah, flat yeah, motor yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's lots of little parts in here. I can see that that's on the side of that's a, a cover for one of those uh, storage containers oh, that's built yeah. into the mud guard. Yep. So hopefully there's four of them in there, but yeah. Until we start digging, we won't know. So the first first step will be to kind of pull it all apart, and, and we're going to wire wheel it, I believe. Yeah, but we. we we're not going to sandblast. We want to keep trying to keep the patina if we can. And I, I, I actually like seeing you know the patina on things. It, it shows it's so the, the rust. The rust, yeah, yeah. And, and shows it's where it's been and what it's done over its service time. So yeah, you can see this is all damaged, sheared off. That's an aluminium. You can see it's all been sheared off, and the, the one over there is missing completely. So it could be in, in the hull, or who knows? Yeah, okay. There's another little weird thing. Is it? I'm not sure if this. This end or the other end, there's a little machine gun mount in here, I believe. A little gimbal here with a machine gun. Yeah, Jason was through. telling us about it. And no extractor fan for the fumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we oh. have two steering wheels, but. Oh, there we go. I'm laughing. It's alright. Nice one. Tire basket wheels off this one, and then. Yeah, and as much of the internal components we can, we can rescue and save, yeah. Nice. Well, you got your work cut out for you, Daryl? Well, never a dull moment there. I'm in the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum. <laughs> We're doing a lot of prep for Oz Armour Fest later this month, so it'll be a few weeks before the boys are ready to get started on this project. 
even though it's only going to be a static display for now, this restoration is still going to have some real challenges, but we can't wait to take you along for the ride with us. That's all we have time for today. Tune in next Wednesday for your weekly tank restoration fix. So until then, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and I'll see you on the next one.